I saw the news on the TV in the morning. It was talking about a big earthquake, which hit my hometown. I called my parents and it didn't go through. So I couldn't check whether they are alive or not. So I just jumped onto the airplane, you know, flew to the nearest airport and then walked to home on that day. How is these were collapsed? And utility poles were broken and people were huddling around the fire because it was January, very cold. That moment affected my life. I have to work, I have to do something in Papua. It starts with just taking that leap. Man, you have to work hard. You have to be incredibly smart. Do something that even if it failed, if it failed, you are going to be out there. Does it matter how badly you got to leave it out? Be kind, be kind, be kind. Become a better person, a better leader, the better beliefs. Go with it. I'm Samuel Donner, and this is Finding Founders. The Kobe earthquake in 1995. At 5.46 in the morning, the city was struck by a 6.9 magnitude earthquake, leaving 6,000 casualties and 45,000 others homeless. Nobu Okada was only just out of college when he witnessed the scene of devastation and decided to turn his life towards a path of action and purpose. But what career would he turn to next? Now we know Nobu is the founder of Astroscale, a company working towards a goal of long-term spaceflight safety by targeting space debris in Earth's orbit. His company has received multiple awards, earning the title of Time 100's Most Influential Companies, Forbes Japan's Startup of the Year in 2019, and the Grand Prix for UNESCO's 2020 Innovation Forum. Despite this incredible growth over the past decade, Nobu's path did not always lay outside the stratosphere, as his career began in government finance, IT consulting, and business startups. Before we reach for the stars with today's guests, let's trace his story back to where it began, the innocent days of science magazines and the promise of space camp. You wanted to be an astronaut when you were a kid, right? Like when you're from pretty young, and I was wondering, like, I guess, how you realized you even wanted to do that. And like, what was, um, what was like your first contact with, oh, like an astronaut would be something cool to be. I have to talk about my mother. My mother kept changing the trajectory of my life. She believed in the power of science and technology, although she was not in that field. When I was in primary school, she subscribed science magazine. It comes with uh, scientific toys from a fish robot to colorful kind of mineral or ores, kind of stones. And those kind of uh, magazines get me close to this uh, science and technology. When I entered junior high school, my mother changed the magazine, science magazine to a more professional. And it's hard to read it for a 13-year-old boy. Yeah, I can imagine. However, it is more professional visuals of the space. When I was 15 year old, there's one article in that Newton magazine, which talked about space camp in America. It was just a kind of a junior astronaut program. And, but it showed all the programs of the space camp, including moonwalk experiences and rocket kind of experience rockets or simulation of the control center. And I told my mother, I want to go, I want to go this. What was she thinking? Cause that's like, you know, you're, yeah, you're in Japan at this time, right? Right. I think she felt, I I got this. <laughs> I was just, um, just a very boy and I didn't have any specific interest. I think she tried to guide me to have some spark in the science technologies. Uh, how did you find out that you would actually go to the space camp? I remember father and mother just said, yes, you should go. And I, I uh, applied for the passport and went to space camp when I was 15. It took 4,000 US dollars at that time and to 
go and buy a kind of with a, a flight uh, ticket and accommodation fee and join the program. Wow, it's it was not it was not easy experience. What was that like? When I arrived in Alabama State and then went to the space camp, I met with NASA engineers, and they were wearing the blue uh, overall and uh, having a big binder on the left left hand and having a big Coke bottle on the right hand. It was cool. <laughs> it was cool. And various rockets are standing on the ground. And then I could look up, you know, these are the real size of rocket that ignite, ignited passion to space in my mind. And then I had a chance to talk with the, the first Japanese astronaut, Mr. Mamoru Mori. He, he was supposed to get on the space shuttle by then. However, there was a sad event in 1986, the Challenger accident. The space shuttle program was postponed at the time. And I, I think that's why he had some time to talk with just kids, including me. And he gave me a handwritten message saying, space is where you shall. And in Japanese, by the way, um, that I clearly remember that moment. I found role model, you know, through NASA engineers and the Japanese first astronaut. I really want to be someone like this. So you go back to Japan. Is that is that right? You're right. Like how, like, like now this dream of wanting to be an astronaut is implanted in your mind. So like. What do you actually do to begin to achieve that? Like, how do you turn your life around? I studied hard because Mr. Mori told me only those people who have a major or expertise can become astronaut. Like a physician can become astronaut or Air Force pilot can become astronaut. However, there's no generic astronaut. So uh, I just started first to try to understand a textbook at school and then try to get better score at school. And uh, that's what I did. Going into thinking about what am I going to do in college? What am I going to do with my career? Like, where are all these dreams? And, and, and what are you thinking you want to do next as you go to college? I had an interest in environmental issues. I joined University of Tokyo, and I studied animal ecology. And <laughs> it is quite an interesting one, but I wanted it to be more logical. So I, I studied population gen genetics. I decided to um, move on to the graduate school. However, in January 1995, just a couple months before I moved on to the graduate school, there was a big earthquake in Japan, Kobe earthquake. How did you hear about the earthquake? Like, where were you when it happened? I saw the news on the TV in the morning. I was talking about big earthquake, which hit my hometown. And it was Kobe is well known for marble Kobe beef. And it was 500 kilometers away from Tokyo. I called my parents and it didn't go through. Just jumped onto the airplane, you know, flew to the nearest airport and then walked to home on that day. I arrived late at night. When I get closer to the Kobe city, houses were collapsed and utility poles were broken and people were huddling around the fire because it was January, very cold, and there's no electricity, no gas. and People were at a loss. They had no idea what to do. Then finally, I arrived to my home and realized my parents were alive. But I also realized we lost our home and relatives. Over the next couple of days, I had to come up with a, with a plan to first move our parents to somewhere safe. That's number one. And, and it, I did that. Two, I had to deal with the body of the relatives. And the bodies were kind of 
laid out. Uh, it was very illegal, but I had to. I moved the the relatives' bodies to kind of other other prefectures to get them burned. That moment affects to affected my life. I, I felt I should stop being in academia. I have to work. I have to do something impactful. I started looking for a huge goal and big impact and steep path to make the lives better for for the people. How did you like consider your next steps or just like how to like, I don't know, just continue being? You know, I talked with, with various people and then I wanted to become a fast track government officer in the Japanese government to influence a policy and do something good. And I studied laws by myself and uh, I stopped, I stopped uh, genetics and I started, sta- started laws by myself. And then actually I passed the exam and I could join the Minister of Finance just two years later. Wow. It was a big win uh, because Minister of Finance has a power to allocate the budget. What do you encounter there? Is it what you thought it would be? Like, do you ha- do you feel like you have the ability to influence the world in the ways that you feel like you can? It was not <laughs> in the end. So the the government was huge organization, and obviously, it's not something which I can influence. But it was okay. I was part of the part of the organization I, I, I really enjoyed, you know, I felt like I was in the center of the government policy and it was good. And then after working a couple of years, I got awarded to study abroad in the U.S. and I studied MBA. I joined, uh, you know, with the, with the government money, but that was my third pivotal, pivotal moment, you know, after uh, meeting at, at a suspense camp, earthquake, and this one, dot com boo. It was 1999. My classmates just left school every week. A couple guys left school and then they said, oh, I raised a couple of million, millions. Said, you know, can you really do that? You know, I, I was so amazed about the dynamics of America. And then everybody, everybody was talking about e-business. E business, nobody's talking about e business anymore. But Napster was born in 1998, I think. And then I, up to Napster moment, and only geeks wanted to connect to the internet. But uh, when Napster came, even the generic public wanted to get connect to the internet, to get the music. And I, I, I saw that moment, and I was so. Once again, I saw that were my colleagues left the schools to set up the new company. I felt, oh, the startups can actually have an impact and has the ability to change society in business. What do you think was different about business in America versus business in Japan? Because although you're working for a government agency, I, I imagine that you had some contact with people who were making businesses in Japan. When I left Japan in 1999, Japan was talking about lost decade. So there was a, do- a kind of a big bubble, bubble economy in 1980s, and it burst, bursted in, in 1989, you know, from 1990 to 1989, there's no growth. And it, it was just, you know, cutting a loss. And, and it was it, not only that, you know, big banks, big security companies went bankruptcy. Everyone's tried to protect themselves. But America at that time was different. Everyone was, was having hope for the future by creating new economy and new business. And I was wondering what did I do? I should step on to the new dynamic or I should go back to the uh, the government after studying. There's a questionnaire from the teachers in it. 
how much money you will earn after graduating um, an MBA. And I, I knew, I knew myself when I went back to to the to the, to the, to the government. It was around um, forty thousand US dollars. Or other classmates were you know talking about six digits. I was not shocked, but I, I felt like it's time to kind of move on to the next step. And so how did you move on to that next step? Like, how did you end up going from the Ministry of Finance to McKinsey? First, I sent the resignation letter to the Japanese government via FedEx. Uh, you know, I sent the resignation through the FedEx box and they made a call to the, the Japanese government. And I want to go back to talk with you. And then I, I, I went back uh, and then told, I want to do something new. And I returned all the money I got from the government. And then um, I actually returned. So, yes, that was a big moment. But right after that, uh, there was a crash of a book on boom. And so you just quit your steady job in Japan in government to move to America because there was someone starting a company every couple months, and then all of a sudden it just disappears because of the dot com crash. Yeah, uh, right. But uh, I tried to find a job, and then I applied to twenty two companies, and I got uh, two offer letters, twenty turn down letters. Wow. So where did you go? One of the offer letter was McKinsey. So um, I moved to Burma. It was not an uh, IT company, but it is a great move for me. McKinsey was interesting, uh, but it was consulting. In, and so after working three and a half years, I joined a very young IT company and became a CFO. Um, and then basically I robbed the company. Um, wow. And it was successful. It was a, a, a Linux OS, operational system company. That was Turbo Linux? Turbo Linux, that's right. Could you quickly lead me up to when you found your software company in Singapore? I set up another company in called Sugao, in which focus on the communication technologies and uh, provide instant messaging like WhatsApp. And um, I sold this solution to the mobile network operators. I just did B2B but not C2C. So now what's up and the nines, you know, they are C2C, but I had no idea how to make money uh, from these. So I, I focus on B2B. It was okay. It was okay, but I couldn't make a significant growth. And all of a sudden I realized C2C players entered the market with the same technologies. Also a smartphone came to the market and then Everybody wants to uh, talk through the data, and I decided because I had we had a technology, so I decided to enter the C two C market and invest a lot. Invested a lot. However, I realized competitors invested two digits more, far more money, <laughs> and I lost the game. Losing money is shocking, really shocking. That must have hurt. What, what, how do you restructure your life after that? I went through midlife crisis. I was about to turn to 40 year old and uh, I had no idea what should I do. And I lost confidence. And, and then, yeah, the midlife crisis took six, six months. What did you do during that crisis? Like, like, like why was it a crisis? I was thinking a lot, um, but after when I do research work, you know, what kind of new technologies, you know, is a, is a kind of next big boom. And when I research and I, when I see the article, it means there are already many people who are already working on that. Right. And, uh, so I got, the, I got a lot at that loss, but uh, one day my wife told me in Nobu, there's a kind of hundred message from Mr. Mori. What it is? And 
you just pick up the, the handwritten message from the Japanese astronaut when I got, when I was 15, I was just putting in the bookshelf and it, he found it and she told me, oh, you should, you should, you should not put this kind of a big handwriting into the bookshelf, you know, you should put somewhere, you know, in the, in the, in, in the wall and it, that reminded me, oh, I had a passion for space. I totally forgot. I totally forgot I had a passion for space. And then I joined multiple uh, space conferences to see what were the hot topics. And then I was thinking it might be a moon exploration or new rocket or Mars exploration. But uh, I realized space debris was a big problem and the space environment was already unsustainable and no one had a solution for the problem. What was so unsustainable about it? What are the uh, potential ramifications? In late April 2013, there was a space debris focused conference in Germany and I went there and I realized there were already around 14 thousand large debris in around the earth. They are traveling around the earth with a tremendous speed, like eight kilometers per second. And imagine 40,000 objects traveling around the earth in different directions. And they, they go around the earth 16 times a day and eventually it, it hits each other and generate new small debris and new small debris can hit other satellites. I also knew our daily lives are dependent on satellites and satellite data. So someone had to solve the problem. So you realize this after going to the conference in 2013, what do you do with that information? I set up Astro scale, Astro scale one week later. Wow. The question is, what did I do during the, the one week? And first I had to get consent from my wife. To start this business? Yes. I said, um, I want to clean up the space debris. And obviously she didn't understand what, what, <laughs> what I told to her. But uh, she asked me, how much saving do we have in the bank account? And I told her, 400,000 US dollars. And uh, she said, okay, maybe you can use 200,000 US dollars. What do you do with that money? How do you get started? When I attended the space conferences, I got uh, USB or CD-ROM, which contained a lot of papers and professional papers, and I downloaded it and then um, and printed out all of them. It was around 700 papers, and I studied a lot about space technologies because I Googled, you know, how to develop satellites, and there's no answer that through Google. And so I had to learn by myself. It took several months to read through, to fully understand the jargons of the space technologies and the space physics. And then I came up with some hypothesis how to clean up a space debris. And uh, each paper has an author and then it, 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 it has an email account. So um, I contacted those professors and then had a world, worldwide tour. However, I had a third round world tour uh, in the first 18 months. And during the third tour, you know, the, you know various, various people said, oh, oh no, it might work. Multiple professors can extend hands, you know, we can support you. Although we cannot provide a engineering job, but we can take part of the research work. So I, Worked with, I think seven, eight university at the beginning, and then, and then raised the fund. You raised seven point seven million dollars, right? Right, right. How did you do that? So, 
when I met with investors, of course, they did not say yes. However, when I visit, visited them two months later, hey, I found two engineers. I found three engineers, and then I could show some progress. And uh, yeah, I mean, I think uh, the, some angel investors appreciated the progress over the time, and then, yeah, I could finally raise 7.7 million. Wow. 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 So, I mean, as long as you, I guess you're showing progress to these investors, then they're like, okay, it makes sense to continually or to continue to invest it. You know, the more and more countries and more companies are entering to this market and they are just inserting satellite and rockets into the limited spaces and then the, the, the space is congested more. So, Good opportunity for us, but we have to move quickly. I want to delve into just like how you actually built this company. There's no magic for the business. You know, every day we have to make one step more. And every morning I take a shower and think about what can I do more today? You know, we, I'm just repeating those days and now we are about to have our 10th anniversary in may in 2023 which means i woke up 3600 days you know every morning i was thinking about space debris right today you know we have uh offices in five countries 400 people raised 376 millions and we through the technologies of space debris in space, you know, for the first time in the world, and then we have a multiple contracts globally, but still we are at the cusp of the booming uh, all orbit servicing market. But uh, if you are asking how I could gradually have an organic growth, for example, when hiring the engineers, I had, I had no network to the engineers, so I attended space conference and saw the their speeches and then I found if I found great engineers great presentation uh, after the speech I get closer to him her and saying I'm doing this and can you join us and and then in a bow actually literally bow and of, of course you know they they did not say yes <laughs> immediately but I, I met with them again in the next conference, you know, in, in half a year later, and then I could show the progress that they are more interested in because space community all talk about space accessibility and not many people are seriously addressing these issues. And I could successfully kind of fire one by one by one, one, one. And then today is different. Today we got the regime every day from the world. It, it's totally different dynamics. But uh, up to 100 people, we could, we had to go around the world, find the right person, and uh, create a great team. How have your responsibilities as a leader changed as the company has grown? I saw many failure cases of CEOs uh, who got crazy because of lots of reasons, personal reasons or pressure from shareholders or mental program, health program, just a kind of family matters affect CEO performance too. And what I have to do is I have, you know, I should scan down the path. I'm an anchor. I'm a fixed point of, of astral scan, right? Uh, we are doing something this 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 disruptive in industry, and we are developing unprecedented technology in the business cases. And th there's no shortest path. That's why internal stability is important. We have to be externally disruptive, but internally stable. I guess how would you recommend people? in their mid-20s balance the extremes between explore, exploring 
a bunch of different things and saying, I'm going to pick one and I'm just going towards that one singular goal. You know, the twenties is a kind of input period, input decade, you know, do whatever you want and do whatever you want. And the thirties, you will meet a lot of people. Thirties is a kind of processing period. And then, you know, that those inputs will become a key message by meeting with many people. So my suggestion is meet as many people as possible. Then you find something focus. You can devote yourself and then just focus on that during my forties or fifties. You know, it, it's just kind of a guidance over the, and the period, but it, it can be changed and you know, people can find something important in earlier days or later days. I was wondering if you could tell me, walk me through some of the piece of advice from mentors, the time you got them and how you implemented that. In November, 2017, we launched our first satellite and it was a big moment for us because uh, our team gathered from many presses and then, you know, worked as a team for the first time. You know, we have investors and we have a partner suppliers and person launch and it should be successful. However, the launch failed. We lost satellite. At that time, I was in Russia, but I decided to quickly go back to Japan because I was wondering, you know, team would kind of uh, go crazy. So I quickly went back to Tokyo and then, then I found our teams were worrying about me. The team felt, you know, something wrong might happen to Noble, you know, Noble had a huge pressure and, you know, we lost a, a satellite. So I really appreciated teams and kind of, uh, support on that. Nobody left the company. And actually, uh, after that, we had another fundraising and we had a record high number of fundraising after that. So I cannot do this business. Just by myself, I realized you know, I can rely on rely more on team. In in that sense, all the team members, four hundred team members, are my mentors. Are there any other like piece of advice that you've given to you know people that you've mentored? We are in a lucky era. You know, through internet, we can get information, human resource, capital, technology. 24 hours a day, I think anything is doable uh, right now. It's, it's far better than 20 years ago. So don't be shy about setting the, the high vision, kind of an uh, unprecedented big vision. And so this era is so, you know, we are born in a very lucky era. Yeah, this is what I'm talking to the, to the next generation. What advice do you think you would give a 25 year old who is maybe a couple years out of college and is maybe starting to find their way in the world. Always use better words, positive words, say thank you. Then you get more information, instruction, guidance, and friends. Thank you so much for listening. If you haven't already, make sure to subscribe, rate the podcast five stars, and share with a friend. If you have any questions or comments, DM us at Finding Founders Podcast on Instagram, LinkedIn, or Facebook. Finding Founders is produced and hosted by me, Samuel Donner. Our Chief of Staff and Operations is Jessica Lin. Our audio editing team lead is Adrian Tapia. Support from Irene Van Berkel, Matt Fernandez, May B. Cannon, Sophia Donner, David Saidi, Ashley Jimenez, Nicholas Guzman, Aaron Devereaux, Sanessa Gisley, and Lois Choi. Our outreach and research lead is Kenny Ong. With support from Sarah Hobson, Cherise Tan, Harushi Kanauchi, Kristen Hagelin, Aya Cortez, and Valencia Lu. Our writing team lead is Elizabeth Bowen with support from Aiden Ashworth, Nikki Mukawa, Sylvie Wong, and Eric Mena. Our design team lead is Shruti Ramanand with support from Tiffany Dang, Yao Lu, and Dina Gabriel. To see more of what we're up to, subscribe to our newsletter at findingfounders.co. Thanks again for listening and see you next week.